Welcome to Time Series Analysis, the second lecture. Now, today we're going to look at regression-based models. First of all, just an introduction, then the general linear model, which is to be the core, also about predictions and fit in some examples here and there. Now, the general form for a regression model is basically, in a nonlinear setting as well, is to say that we have some observations, they are a function of some input, time, potentially, and some parameters, and plus we have some observation noise. That is what we have. And what we aim to do is to model the output using all the information that we have. Now, in practice, you can have the input being stochastic variables as well. We looked at that to some extent last week. Now, we will also, today, we will consider the input to be known as a non-random and write it, therefore, as a lowercase x here. <coughs> but that's just to make things easier. And we will also assume that the residuals from the model, the epsilons here, have a covariance structure that has this form, so there is a general variance here, sigma t squared, and then you have a potential or a uppercase sigma that gives the correlation structure, and also if you have different weights, we'll get back to that. Often, what you'll do in ordinary least squares is that you will assume that that is an identity matrix saying that they all have the same variance. Just a quick example as to how could a nonlinear model look like. So here we have a function up here, a generic function with three parameters. And just to show what is the flexibility, if we play around, have this as, as reference, then we can shift it by changing theta 3. We shift it to the right in this case. But we can also say that we'll change the scaling of it so that it doesn't go to 2 but goes to 1. And also, we can look at the steepness here of the, of the curve by looking at the parameter that we multiply on x in here. That's just an example. And where is this sort of function applicable? Well, one typical case, not saying this is the optimal model, but it's very often that you see that you have something that has a lower limit, and then you have a, an hour limit, and then you have some transition. And the challenge is to figure out what is the slope of that transition and what is you can say, where is that transition as well? An example, I said, could be wind turbines. What is the produ power production giving a wind speed? So when the wind is not blowing, we have no production. At some point, it saturates. And it doesn't ma matter if you increase the wind speed, it won't produce more until it turns off. But that's another story. So in the ordinary least square setting, we have pairs of observations with predictors. We say we have n of those. What we want to do is to find the set of parameters that minimize the sum of squares. We can write it like this, where we define s of theta as the sum of the prediction errors from t equal 1 to n, or write it as a sum like this. Now, when I see a sum like this, in this course, of course, you can write many things with sum, but I prefer to deal with things as vectors. So S of theta here, if epsilon of theta, because the epsilon depends on, is a function of the parameters, if that's a column vector, then if we take this transpose and multiply it with itself, then we have an inner product. And with that inner product, we get the sum. So that's at least a nicer way to, to write it up for now. Now, when things are unweighted, as we have in this case, then in order to get reliables, then the errors, as in all those errors here, they're assumed to be with the same variance and independent, as in mutually uncorrelated, what we will refer to as IID, independent, identically distributed. So in this model, an estimator of the variance of that is to take, well, what is the sum of squared errors and just divide that by the number of parameters and uh, a number of degrees of freedom for the residuals, which will be the number of observations minus the number of parameters. So that's one thing. The other thing is, if we look at the 
variance of our estimate because this is a statistics course, so we don't want just to have estimates. The likelihood that we estimate the correct values is zero. So what we have to look at is also some measure of uncertainty. And one typical thing when things are normally distributed at least is to look at the variance. So the variance of the estimate that we get, we'll get back to how to estimate it. So the variance in for definition of, of theta is two times our most likely estimated s sigma hat square times the inverse of the second order derivative of this function here is of theta and then we want to uh, that and we will evaluate it at theta equals to our estimated theta hat so that's our general for any least squares problem that will be our estimator for the variance in practice you need to do nonlinear optimization in order to solve these problems. So we will here restrain ourselves to look at linear functions, where we can write our observation as a some x here as a vector, become it's a column vector and it transposes to be a row vector, and then multiply that with some parameters, and then again some observation noise. So first of all, just think of what can be in that x here. In this case, we have theta 0, theta 1, and theta 2 as our parameters. And now we want to have z and z square at time t as our predictors. Does that make sense in a linear regression model? That to have something square? Yes, it does, because you can pre-calculate that. So what it matters is that we have to be linear in the parameters. So we cannot have a nonlinear function as we did in the previous example of the parameters. Just very, very briefly recap general linear models. What are the different options that we have? We have a pure regression model where we have an intercept and a slope. Now, you can also, this could be, say, if you're looking at the plants, then you have the age, and then, say, soil concentrations of various things. As an example, you also have, you can say, what is called analysis of variance, where you look at the observations belonging to some class, and then you have a mean value within each class, plus some noise. That could be, say, the height of different species. Further on, you can combine the two and do what we call analysis of covariance, where you have, say, an intercept that is for different species, but then you have a common slope in this case. The slope could, of course, also be depending on the species, but that's a very, very general class of, of models. We can do many things here. The one thing that combines them is that what we do with these uh, here is that we put them into the x vector as predictors. Are we at this class or that class? And we use indicator functions to indicate whenever you have these factor variables here or treatments. You code them as 0, 1 vec uh, values here. And there are some examples in the book if you want to see more. But this was just a quick recap.